me tonight that when you're riding solo, sometimes it feels like you'll never get to the end. Sometimes it's rough and you think you're on the right track and when you're on the right track, it seems like all kind of roadblocks and stumbling blocks and mountains come out and you say, I'm doing it right now. I'm riding solo. I'm doing exactly, God, what you're saying to do. But why is all this happening to me? God said, be patient that the promise is closer than you think. But a lot of times when you're riding solo, it's, I found out that it's hard to encourage yourself. You need somebody to encourage you because we've always heard when we was a baby coming out the womb, somebody was encouraging us. Oh, he or she's so pretty. Look at my baby. We've always been praised when we really didn't do nothing. We just came out the womb and now they're praising us. So now we get a false pretense of what we should be doing and what we should be looking for in praise. Praise should come when we do what? It says it right here in the text. It goes back and say, when we show faith and patience. I can't believe, man, you waited that long. But look at how God blessed you. I can't believe you kept saying, my God, even when it felt like he was your enemy. Jeez, I'm preaching. But that's true. That, that's where we are with riding along. The promise is closer than you think. It's necessary at some point in your life to have the, the ability to construct the path to walk on alone. If you don't put it together, then God will allow things to happen to make you walk. Oh, I don't want to say make because he doesn't make. Allow you to see what it feels like to walk alone. It's, it's tough, but it's, it's necessary. I, I, I like how people won't say it, but it's true that the things that we need the most sometimes is strength and being fortified. The question comes at what do we need to be fortified with? Do I need to be fortified with my church? And a lot of people, first lady, are fortified with the church. They are fortified with the members of the church. They are fortified even with the pastor and the first lady. But you need to be fortified with God. We're just vessels, and we're, we're here to do an assignment just like everybody else. It's good to be friend, and it's good to honor those who have rule over you or those who are in positions that, that, that require that. But at the end of the day, you really need to be fortified with God, which is the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. That's the three-head God that you should ask yourself every day. Am I fortified with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Or am I fortified with my bank account because I look at my bank account more than I look at my Bible or I, I, I talk on the phone more than I pray or, or I'm, I'm asleep when I should be fasting or, you know, it's just I'm looking at this when I really should be studying this over here. What are we really fortified with? Because who you fortify with lets you know how you ride. Am I riding Alone, or am I riding by myself, or am I riding in the ways of the world? Is God riding with me, but nobody can see him, but I know he's my passenger? In fact, the many times he drives the car for me, what is the car? My life. What is my life? My thoughts, because what I think is what I am. So what it says, so if a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. What I think up here matters. The devil comes to try to sift your mind, because he you know that the mind is a terrible thing to waste. We waste it without the devil. We waste it because of fear. We waste it because of anxiety. We waste it because of our past. We waste it because of the culture we're in, the atmosphere that we have created. We waste so much time riding with everyone else, trying to please everyone else. If I please him, he won't leave. If I buy her lunch, she'll be my friend. If I get my kids, whatever they want, they'll truly love me. But we try to do whatever we can to appease other people so that they'll ride with us. When the truth be told, we don't need none of them. What we need is what we cannot see. But we have to have faith in it. And that's the hand of God. Amazing how we have to remain fortified and be through fortification of your word, you become strengthened. We have to learn to stay on track when we're riding solo. You, it's, you cannot detour and get off track when you're riding solo because the risk factor go up. Because now I'm alone and I don't have nobody in the flesh watching my back. Because all those people who I thought was watching my back, they really weren't watching my back. They was watching me hoping I fall. 
So I'm really better off without them. So now I have to make sure that I'm riding. As I'm riding, I have to make sure that I stay on track. Don't deviate. Don't procrastinate. And don't be frustrated when things don't go your way. All you have to do to win this battle of riding along is stay on track. But it's hard to stay on track. It's challenging to stay on track because there's so many distractions while you're driving. You're reading your Bible or you're praying and your mind wanders. Okay, I, I, let me talk to the television. Are there, is there somebody on television tonight that sometimes you're praying and your mind just wanders? And you'd be like, what did I just say in my prayer? I know I wasn't in the anointing. I, I, just, I just started thinking about what's coming on TV today. Yeah, I've, I've gotten off track. You know, I, I procrastinate a lot, so I never move, although I'm riding solo. Jesus. <laughs> I'm, I'm by myself all the time. Yeah, you're by yourself, but you haven't accomplished anything. It's a difference in riding solo from the flesh and God's riding with you and riding in the world. I'm riding by myself, but I don't have God with me. So I'm never accomplishing the things of God. I'm by myself and wonder why I can't never get no traction. But I go to church every Sunday. I pay my tithes all the time, but I'm never getting no traction because I'm riding by myself, Mother Brooks, but I don't have God riding with me for the just in case I need to take the detour. That day I decided to go by the bar. I decided to get two drinks on the way home, get some Tic Tacs, tic -tacs. Some, some gum. People, do people still eat Tic Tacs? Okay, I never really liked them anyway. Okay, Altoids, I was talking to the Universal Church when I said Tic Tacs. <laughs> there are times that we try the human soul to make it the best we can, but the road of riding by yourself becomes so violent. It becomes so perplexing. It gets to the point to where you don't even know if you can drive anymore, or sometimes you don't even realize, or you ask yourself, how did I get here? I moved forward, but I don't know how I got here. I'm so perplexed with so many things in my life, so many things going on. I don't know if the spirit should be labeled spirit, parentheses, anxiety, or spirit, parentheses, stress, because it seems like those are the two things that are riding with me all the time. Can I get a witness? Yeah, I, yeah, somebody's riding with you, but who is it? And why are they riding with you? Why do you let these things ride with you that don't have a heartbeat? Never let anything defeat you that doesn't have a heart. Because that's just something in your mind. You can control your thoughts, but your th thoughts most times are controlled by your flesh. And your flesh is controlled by the world. That's why the Bible say, be ye transformed from this world by the renewing of your mind. So if my mind has been renewed, then my spirit will be renewed and the things of the world will be shut off. They, they automatically shut off. You don't have to go do nothing now. You don't have to go drink garlic and none of that. It just shuts off. It, it shuts off because that's what the spirit is there for. I mean, it, it is really there. Truth be told, all of us have had moments well, we wanted to throw our hands up. We all have had those moments when we wanted to throw our hands up, when we wanted to quit. It was, a lot of times it's right after you got saved. It, it, it's right after you thought you were really doing good in Christ and you didn't realize that was another chapter. You didn't realize that serving Christ has seasons. Yeah, and, and you just was in the spring. Everything was blossoming and you, you was good. And then you say, yeah, summer coming, but summer going to bring a heat that if you're not watering that thing correctly, it'll burn it up. Most people don't like the winter because the winter kills. No, the winter don't kill. It germinates in a way. It kills everything that should die. And the things that should come back through germination, they live. Because the things that have a deep root in them, they won't die. He'll prune those things. Come on now. <laughs> He'll prune those trees. You thought that thing was dead. Oh, hold on. Let me bring this back to the world. You thought that you thought I wasn't going to make it. <laughs> you thought you had counted me out for dead. You thought I was down and out. Didn't have a dime. You were ready to kick me. But in my winter, you didn't know that I was still attached. 
My roots were still attached and I was still had somebody riding with me called God. So because you couldn't see him and you could only see my situation, that means you couldn't see the spirit. <laughs> and my spirit was in me that God was coveting and God was driving me, ordering my steps while you were yet talking. And you notice that there's something came called separation, distance between me and you. And the distance between me and you came by the order of God with my steps. I'm so thankful right now that I keep my eyes on the prize of the higher calling. I keep my eyes on God. And he keeps me in perfect peace. Why they say keep your eyes on God? Because he keeps me in what? Perfect peace. If you keep your eyes what? Stayed on him. You should have an attitude when you say that to people. Why you at peace and you on the bus? Because I keep my eyes what? Stayed on him. Why you ain't mad and I just talk bad about you? Because I keep my eyes what? Stayed on him. Why you walking around and you broke and you ain't disgusted? Because I keep my eyes what? Stayed on him. Why you keep your eyes on him? Because he riding for me. He rides for you. He, he rides for you. He rides with you. He rides for you. And he makes sure you're safe in your journey. Now, he didn't say you want to have some hitchhikers. Yeah, you know those hitchhikers? Those hitchhikers are people that you know that want to keep you where you was. Th those are hitchhikers. Hitchhikers, they, they start degrading you because you're not speaking the same language they speak anymore. Y'all still speak English, but different content. Whew. Hitchhikers, while I'm riding. You know, illness come out of nowhere. I, I talked to a friend of mine today, he called, and I don't even remember the the diagnosis he has, but it's something that causes him, as he get older, to slur. It causes his mind to deteriorate and his body to start going in where he now he's at the point to where he has to help, have people help him walk. Now, this guy right here was notorious for, I think his name used to be like, do dirty. Lamar Brown, my buddy, bad boy. Bad dude. And to see him where he is now, so fragile. It, it, it's an awakening. And I thank God that he had time to change vehicles. I thank God that at this point that he can't really pronounce words like he used to. He know God. And I'm glad God did something, put something in place for him, even in his car. He said, if you can't open your mouth, you can hmm to me in the spirit. <laughs> and that's what, that's what they used to do in the slave days. We, we, we do it now to show off in the church. And God, I say, you know, and get all moaned. They used to do it back then so the white man couldn't know what they were talking about. Now, now he, he's right there at that stage of his life where I can't even talk, yet I praise him now more than I've ever praised him. That's how you ride. That's how you get closer to the promise. The promise is closer than he thinks. I look at people, and most people, oh, I don't want to see them like that. Look at them, because it's life. Because to you, on your best day, when you were sitting and your hair fixed and you had this, this suit on there, thing, people were looking at you like, child, please. Look at the shoes that she got on with that. That don't go together. You can never win. So you might as well... If I'm an heir, let me err on the side of Christ. You know, because he rode so low. Or should I say, so he thought. Uh, <laughs> come on, Holy Ghost. He, he thought, Jesus thought he was riding so low. When times got rough, when there was no detours, and he had to go straight. Oh, when he, he knew what was coming, when Paul tried to stop him and prevent him from going to Jerusalem, he told Paul, no, I, no, he, he told Paul, get thee behind me, Satan, because he knew if I let you ride with me, I will detour. But he said before that, he tells Paul, Satan has taken over your flesh. 
He said, you speak it from the flesh as man. That lets me know you can't have man riding with you when you're walking for Christ. Because Christ tells, he tells Paul, I mean, he tells Peter, Peter, you have talk coming out of your mouth as of man. He, he said, Peter, you, you have talk coming out of your mouth as a man. How are you going to talk to a spirit from the flesh? Peter goes back and curl up. Here's the thing, though. He knew even after telling Peter that, his day was going to come to when he had to ride alone. He had to ride solo. But he knew that in order to get to the promised land, he had to ride alone. And he knew the trip was straight for. That there were no more pull-offs, no parks. I can rest. He, he, he couldn't rest anymore. He knew that once I get to Jerusalem and once those so-called Christians get a hold of me, my trip has just begun. My, my trip has just begun. Why? Because now I can't truly fulfill this text until they come to the garden and watch this here and say they look for me jesus they, they can't I, I can't ride solo until i can go before my father and say hey they didn't even know it was me i came and say who is it that you look for jesus it is i what is he saying man he's saying right now hey i'm ready to ride what solo i have an idea of what's coming but i'm not totally sure because Jesus had to walk every step that we would walk, which means I know that there's going to be a lot of tormentation, but in that tormentation, I don't know exactly how it's going to come. I know the customs in which they, they do things, but I don't know exactly how it's going to come to me because I'm not man. <laughs> so I know that it's going to be greater, my suffering, while I'm riding solo. He knows this, and he goes with, they don't even realize who Jesus is. He, it is I you look for. Peter comes to try to cut somebody's ear off because Peter's having a bad season. The season for Peter is bad, and, and that, that's not uncommon because all of us at some point feel like we're having a bad season. If it ain't this is that. If it ain't that, it's something else. Every day seems like night. I can't sleep at night. And during the day, I am so tired. Everybody has that season when they can't quite get it together. This time right here don't mean nothing because this clock in your head keep ticking and this clock up here got you going around in circles. Anxiety is building. You want to separate from the things of God and you don't want to be around nobody. You want to isolate yourself in the wrong way. See, there's two ways you should isolate yourself. You want to isolate yourself from people and God. God say, isolate yourself from people, but come to me. That's why when Jesus would lead people, he would lead the disciples. He would go up in the mountains to see his father because sometimes we all need a good little talking to. We all need encouraging and we get encouraged when we're walking alone knowing that we're closer to the end. We're closer than we think. Oh, Jesus. God bless Jesus. People don't realize when you really start didacting Jesus, the agony mentally that he went through before he even got into the gates of Jerusalem, just knowing what he was going to have to deal with. But he got on that horse, that donkey, and he rode. And he rode on a donkey. He rode in on a donkey. Donkeys weren't even really fit to be rode. Donkeys were there to protect the sheep. Because oh, <laughs> donkeys are very aggressive when it comes to animals that they covet. Oh. Yeah, you get a thoroughbred, a Mustang or something out there, put them up against a donkey. That donkey bloodline from over there off of Cleveland Avenue. You have to kill a donkey. 
He, but the good thing about it, though, the one he was on had never been rowed. <laughs> See, we can't, we're moving somewhere. Now, let me say that again because we've got some slow people out there in the audience. I say the one that he rode on had never been rode. What does that mean? Everybody has their own ride. Everybody has their own vehicle that they must drive to do the will of God. And for some people, it's pastoring a church. And for some, it's a first lady of the church. And for some, it's the mother of a church. And for some, it's a musician in a church. And for some, it's an elder or an administrator. And for some, it's an usher at the church. But whatever your vehicle is, understand, it's yours to ride. And your vehicle hasn't been written by nobody else. That's why you can't imitate people. Because you're trying to ride in a Corvette, and I'm too big to get in a Corvette. He got me in a truck. And I'm trying to squeeze in a Ferrari because it's fast. That don't fit me. I got to ride in what God has already provided with me, my spiritual vehicle. What is my spiritual vehicle? I know my thoughts <laughs> concerning you. They are good and not of evil, but to give you what? An expected end, a promise. He's going to give you a promise and an expected end. But you got to be in your ride. You can't ride. Some people in here can't drive a stick. So he won't give you a stick to drive. He knows the gifts he's given you. He's going to give you the vehicle to drive that fits your gifts. But we have to be willing to ride. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. His ride was nice until he got to the gate. And when he went into the gate and they had the palm trees, all at his feet. And while he was driving, he was sideways. He didn't want to commit too much to it. He would have got too comfortable and probably not have never got off. Some of us get too comfortable in a season. Some of you get too comfortable in a season. And the reason you can't go no farther isn't because God hadn't heard your cry. It's because you don't want to get off. You want to stay right where you are. I'm having a good time doing right what I'm doing. And, and God's going to forgive me eventually. And, and I know that what I'm doing right now, it ain't right. But God, God, I'm, God I'm going to get it right after a while. Nobody knows the time nor the hour that your ride will run out of gas. When your ride got to go to the junkyard and you have no car to ride because you got to go before the judge. Riding alone is serious. We, we get discouraged and we cry in secret when we're riding and it gets tough sometimes. We, we, we get discouraged and we cry secretly. We hide behind our clothes when we get discouraged from riding by ourselves. Because you get discouraged sometimes. You don't have to look at me like that, but you get discouraged sometimes and, and you try to hide behind your clothes or you, you, you put the cake all over your face so, so the tears won't come down, at least until you get home. You get a new hairdo and you think that makes you feel better, but you really don't feel better only if let somebody else tell you you look nice because you don't have enough self-esteem to drive yourself. You've seen people who always have to have other people remind them of who they are because they don't really know who they are. And they don't know who they are because they don't know whose they are. So they're always looking for somebody to always pat them on the back. You've seen those type of people. They can't do nothing. They walk into school and they, you saw how I walked in today. I, I, you saw me, girl. I walked, yeah, I walked around today. I walked, I walked around the parking lot to get in. I ain't just come down the steps. And the people looking like, okay. I wasn't even watching you walk because I'm watching what my husband said to me nasty when I left the house. Okay, <laughs> they don't like that. that. I, I, well, I'm, I'm riding in my own car. I, don't, I can't even think about you because I'm thinking what my oldest daughter trying to do. And you're worried about thinking I'm watching you, but people need that. A lot of people do that and walk by and make sure they dress just right and make sure you're right where they need you to be so they can. 
Then they'll look at the shoe twice. And you're looking at them, they look until you fall them down. Oh, man, no, those nice, man. Those are really nice, brother. I know right now you ain't riding, you're walking. Some people, and this is sad to say, but some people even hide behind their smiles. Have you ever forced a smile? <laughs> you hated who you were talking to, but you forced a smile. All in the name of the Lord. Uh, the whole time they was talking, you were thinking about how I can kill you two times. Okay. You should have been able to kill somebody two times, but the grace of God helped you because you let him ride with you. This thing of discouragement is serious when you're riding alone because if it don't catch you on the way to work, <laughs> it will catch you on the way home. So you ever been riding and you don't, I don't even want to go home? Have you, I may have been there. Let's raise your hand one time because all those didn't line. At some, at some time, Mother Brooks, we all have been at the point to where we didn't want to go home. And it probably didn't have nothing to do with the people in your house. It had everything to do with you and how you're riding. I should be further along. I don't, I don't know how she got ahead of me. She was on the bus, and I had my plucker. She moved beyond the plucker and went straight to a new car. I don't know how that happened. But now I feel stressed. She don't slept with everybody on the football team and got married to somebody off the basketball team and I'm still single. I got to get some more people. <laughs> because that discouragement will follow you when you're riding. It, it'll follow you everywhere. You'll start looking around engaging other people. Why it had to happen to me? Why it didn't happen to her? She ain't no good. All she do is she's a stick stirrer. She just stir up stuff all the time. And it seems like she don't never go through. And then when you see him, how you doing? Good girl, I hadn't seen you in a minute. Yeah, because a lot of times we hide behind our smile. Truth be told, you are angry with that. You are angry when other people get what you desire. Jeremiah over in chapter 12 talks about that. He, he talks about, turn to Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1. Since this Bible study, I can go there. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1 right quick. It's over in the New Testament. Watch what Jeremiah says here. You have it? Say amen. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 12, verse 1. Y'all need to get you some Bibles. I know if that phone go out, you're going to be in trouble. Look at what Jeremiah says right here. You are always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. <laughs> you see how Jeremiah playing God? Look, look at this right here. He said, you are always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you. Yet I would speak with you about your justice. Now, now, now look what he asked God. Why do all, why does the way of the wicked prosper? Wow. Why does the way of the wicked prosper? Because when you're riding, you'll see that. Why it seem like all the people with all the money want more money? Why it seem that as you're living, and your life is passing you by, you see all these people that got you voting for them on either side, and, and, and all of them really have their own curriculum. And it's just where you fit in. It wasn't you and mine. They'll use you as propaganda, but uh, as a distraction, but it's really what they want. Why, why is it that they are really serving an audience behind a curtain? Those are the people that they have to fulfill. Why? Why is it? He, he says, why does the way of the wicked prosper? But look what he says before this. You're always righteous, Lord, when I bring a case before you. Then he come and ask him, why, why you do this with the wicked? Why, why is this happening? Jeremiah had to watch other people 
be set free. Now, now remember Jeremiah, when he was told that he was going to be a prophet for God, he was going to be king. He was in the lineage for kingship. And God takes him out of the lineage for kingship and allow him to become a prophet, which is bigger than a king. Jesus. He didn't like that. He, he didn't like that. So now he's got a group of people that are disgruntled following him. He, he's their pastor, so to speak. And these people that are following him are watching other people who are not doing what they do get what they want. Jesus Christ. <laughs> oh, you got to read this. Jeremiah is a bad boy. I'm telling you, if there's anybody that you can relate to, if you bipolar in here, schizophrenic, read on Jeremiah. Jeremiah went through a whole lot in the Bible. The people that he had, now these people are on him, so now he goes to God, but he goes to God not in prayer. He goes to God, what, to complain, Jesus Christ. How many of y'all have prayed before and you didn't go to God thanking God for where you are? You went up there and started fussing at God because he hadn't done what you felt should have been done in the time frame you thought it should be done. Somebody say Jeremiah, Jesus Christ. Jeremiah was in a tough situation. Saints are sad. Why sinners rejoice? It shouldn't be that way. But why is it that way? Saints are sad. Why sinners are satisfied. You pay your tithes. You in church when the doors open and close it down. And you got a friend who don't even go to church. They don't even pay tithes. And everything you seem to desire it seems like they get. And you look at them and say, they ain't even riding in the same lane that I'm riding in. How did they get to obtain all these wonderful things that I so desire that being a child of God, I should have. That's why Jeremiah comes and says what he says in this right here in the text. Why do the wicked prosper? Because it confuses the mind of the Christian because they're watching something they shouldn't be watching. You and somebody else's Kool-Aid when yours don't have enough sugar in it. And then watching them how can you watch the road? How, how can you watch the road? That's what's so beautiful about Jesus. When he was going and, 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 and when, when, when the, the, the general was talking to him, he just looked at him, looked right through him. When Pontius Pilate was looking right at Jesus, he looked right through him. You know why? Because he was focused on the road. So it don't matter what people say to you. Do you know that I can have you killed with just a one, one sentence? He, you can only do what my father allow you to do. Oh, Jesus. Jesus. You see how he defamed a man of power with one sentence, but with a lot of action that came before the sentence? His action and demeanor before the sentence was, you don't run me. Because the only thing that can run me is the thing that's driving me. And you're not in my car. My daddy is driving my car. So whatever you say, somebody help me say it, don't matter. So you got to be careful and ask yourself when people are talking and stuff, you just look right through them. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You ain't in the car. So whatever you say has no merit, it has no traction, has no wheels. Not where I'm going. Look what he says right here now. Jeremiah's off the chain. He says, why do all the faithless live at ease? Ooh, Mother Brooks. Why do all the faithless live at ease? You have, now, now look what he said now. But now in the first sentence, he, he goes and tells God how God always be righteous with the questions that he asks for. Now he's coming down here and he's dissecting everything that God does in his eyes because he's like gotten his eyes off the road. People will get your eyes off the road. The people have gotten Jeremiah so tired as a pastor that now he's going to ask God, why? Well, it ain't no different with Moses. Moses, Moses. Moses, speak to the branch, and water would come. The people was on Moses so hard about the drinking the water, 
Moses, strike it again. Strike, strike the rock again. God said, speak to it. He struck it again, and water came. But look how cruel his punishment was. In the instance, he had allowed somebody else to get in the car and push God out. Because one thing I've learned in serving God, is God don't ride with nobody else. God said, if I'm going to be your Uber driver, it's going to be me and you. I deal with one set of directions at a time. <laughs> so he ain't trying to deal with you and have somebody else going over here in the car. That's called confusion. No, I need to be in the car with God. I don't want nobody in the car with me when I'm dealing with God. I want all that to myself. I want to be selfish sometimes when it comes to my Savior. I want to be sanctified when it comes to my Savior. I want to be sanctimonious when it comes to my Savior. I, I, I want to be ready. I don't want no distraction. So you got to get out. You got to go. Moses suffered because of the pressure of the people. The same holds true with Jeremiah. Jeremiah is stressed because of the people that he's telling about God and what's to come. He's telling them what's to come through God. They're looking at what other people are attaining right now. He says it right here. Why do all the faithless live at ease? Then he says right here. Now, this is what's touching. You have planted them. And they have taken root. Ooh, 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 ooh. Jeremiah is brave soul. Then he tells them, they grow and bear fruit. So it's one thing to plant them. It's another thing when they take root and now they're bearing fruit. Jesus. And, and they're not suffering. They're not going through what we're going through. They're not walking the walk we're walking. They're not following your prophet. But yet they're obtaining more. You got to remember, it was a king that wanted Jesus dead. A king of earth, that was. King Herod wanted Jesus dead. He had roots, but they weren't the right roots. And neither were they planted in the right soil. So a lot of people don't realize you can plant a tree in dirt. And if you just plant that tree in dirt, the chances are greater that it dies. It might not grow like it should. I learned this on TV last night, HGTV. But when you, when you plant that tree and you put dirt in there with it, that's fine. But then they come and get that black soil. And they put that black soil on top of the dirt. And that cultivated, and that black soil have minerals in it that the dirt don't have. Y'all, I'm preaching this. Woo good God. Am I, this is going to help somebody in their garden. This is going to help you in your garden. But these people don't believe that God is putting soil on top of their dirt. No, they, they can't see that far. They just want to be planted. And that's what I get where people just want to be in relationships, friendships. They don't care how the other person's planted. I just need a friend. I just want somebody to talk to. And I'm not talking about a relationship, boyfriend and girlfriend. I'm just talking about friends in general. We, we don't even take heed about the people in our circle. You let people say anything around you. They can walk in the way around you. They can do whatever they want to around you, and you won't say nothing. Yet you want God to put soil on your roots when you don't even care about your roots. You let people do what they want to around your roots. They step on your roots, spit on your roots, dig them up, kick the tree. And God said, why would I give you some soil when you're allowing them to do your tree in dirt like that? Little becomes much when you place it in the master's hand, but also... He who is faithful over a few things. The Bible says he'll make them rulers over much. If you can't take care of them roots in that tree, make sure the dirt's on top and then make sure the soil's on top of that and make sure don't nobody get close to it. You can't handle a bigger tree. If you can't handle the ride when God is riding with you at 35 miles an hour, why would, you, why would God speed up your car to get you to the destination faster? When you haven't proven, you can't handle the speed you're going at. I want this and I want that, and, and your motor ain't ready for it. 
your mind isn't ready for it. I just want this and that, and you lie to yourself and say, I'm going to do better with this. You never do better till it's done. Let me say that again, because they missed that. We never do better until it's done. If you're still talking about what you're going to do, you'll never do it. Show me when it's done. I don't have a lot of time for, the older I get now, the more I realize I value life. And I don't have a a lot of time to let any and everybody in my ears, because my ears are connected to my heart. So I want to make sure that my heart stays fresh and healthy so I make sure I have to govern my ears. So all that people telling me what they're going to do, when they're going to do it, how they're going to do it, I don't have time for it. I want to hear about what's been done. One of the greatest things in the Bible is a couple of words that say it. It is finished. Jesus said that when he was on the cross, when everything, all his riding had come to an end. He, it, it is finished. Now we always look at that and say, man, he, he was a tough cat. But it wasn't meant for him to be on the road of Golgotha to show how tough he was. We missed that first lady. Everybody, he was tough. Yes, he was tough. He was tough enough to endure the pain because the agony and the pain that he went through while he was on that road is what God wanted people to see, how he sacrificed himself for other people, how he hurt, but he kept going, how he cried, he kept going. He was bleeding, but he kept going. That's what God say, show people how to ride. Show them how to ride so they won't have any excuse as to why they can't. He was riding solo. And they tried to get a man man of African-American descent to help him with the cross. Because this cross was heavier than others. Most crosses was at one, 25 pounds, 50 pounds maybe. Jesus' cross was over 100 pounds of wood that he was carrying by himself. They get another man to help him. Now they put another man in the car. Man put another man in the car. God didn't put the man, man put another man in the car because they wanted Jesus to finish. <laughs> they didn't even realize what they was doing. When God's ride for you, he'll make your enemy your footstool. While they're talking about you and doing stuff, they'll be doing stuff that's going to help you and don't even realize it. That's what the Romans were doing. They, they didn't even realize that they was helping Jesus on this ride. And as he's riding, now they get this guy, he comes out there and he helps Jesus for a while. It's a big old guy. And now this guy, he's about to die. He said, let me help him up here so I can get off from under this. And he helps Jesus till he gets to the top of the, the hill. And now he's on the skull. And while they finally let the man leave, or before he left, let me say this. The whole time he was helping Jesus, what people don't realize, he was being beat too. <laughs> Oh, so make sure when your friends say they're your buddies, they're your friends, they hanging out with you, make sure they'll take a beating with you. <laughs> make, make sure they'll sacrifice for you. Make sure they'll walk with you, brother. We'll eat bread and eggs for the next two weeks together. But I'm right. We don't have friends like that. We have very few friends like that. This guy didn't even know Jesus, but he was in the car with Jesus long enough to get in there and help him with the cross. And when he got to his place where they told him he can go, they hit him again anyway. After he had gotten off under the cross with Jesus, they were, wow. They were, ah, I, it, was, it was traumatizing. Ah, he screamed. He back your night when your mama hit you in the back. Well, I probably shouldn't say that on TV. When your mama chastised and your back get off. That's how that grown man was. Ah. That joy, it, they hit him so hard, Jesus was going this way. He didn't even go to see the finish. He ran that way. He didn't want to ride no more. Because when you're going through what God got you to go through, you'll learn most of your friends, they want to get out the car. When you get getting sick in the hospital, see how many people call you. Huh. When you're sick, see how many people text you or call you or come see you. Very few. And you, I thought that was my buddy. No, that ain't your buddy. That's an associate. Because they're not in the car with you. So Jesus get him off. And now Jesus at the top of the cross, at the hill, and he's got to get on that cross. But they don't let him climb on the cross. They bring the cross down to him. They bring it down to him. 
and they nail him to the cross. That's why I'm so glad that the car that God makes for you, it's an all-season type of car. It's an all-season, uh, all-terrain type of vehicle. Because Jesus still had to take that car up on that cross with him. He had to take that car on that cross with him. He had to show on that cross that I'm still riding. And then God allowed two people to come by and entertain for a while, two men that was definitely sinners. The only difference was one was a believer and the other didn't. See, when you're riding sometimes, people will come and they'll look like distractions. But be careful. Don't judge people by the flesh. The Bible says know the spirit by the spirit. Jesus could have condemned both of those men while they was up there in their cars. But the one who said, not take me, remember me when you get to paradise. He, you don't have to take me, remember me. My car won't make it there. I know what my car can do, what it's capable of, but yours going to make it. Remember me, and Jesus tell him this day. Jesus. People don't realize what goes into that stretch of, of, of the parable. He say, this day. Jesus in his car, he bleeding the oil leaking, transmission fluid tow up. Jesus right there, but he got enough in him to turn to this man and say, this day. He put himself to the side because that was part of his journey. Because everybody saw it. Everybody who was there saw this day. You shall be with me in paradise. Your heart just allowed God to send you the atlas on how to get to heaven. He's going to heaven with Jesus, but it wasn't done for Jesus. The other man did what he do. He talked bad about him like everybody else. And the crows came and pricked his eyes out. Pricked his eyes out. His car wasn't worthy of having no headlights. He had to go in the dark. It's amazing. All the parts on your car, how they play a valuable role in your life valuable role in your life. It was only when Jesus gave up the keys, God let him get out that car and put him in another one for the remainder of his journey. Now some popular, somebody would say, why? Would he stay in? Why wouldn't he stay in that car, first lady? He was in the car all along. Why we, we couldn't stay in that car? Well, because now he had transformed from the flesh to a spirit. Because his flesh always stayed on earth, but the Bible declared that he went down into hell for three days. And he went with a purpose to what? Take the sting out of death, Mayor, Mayor Dixon. He took the sting out of death. So he couldn't go in that car. That car was still on the cross. So he had to switch cars. Uh, let me say it like this. He had to upgrade. <laughs> he upgrades the car. And he goes down into hell and it takes three days because death is hiding from him. And he finds death, do what he got to do. Then he surfaces again and the disciples see him. But this time, he don't change cars. He can't change cars now. I know he doesn't change cars because he tells the disciples, you can't touch me. I haven't ascended to my father yet. So I know he changed cars. He had to upgrade. And at this point, nobody on earth could touch him. So he was speaking miracles into people. 
In speaking miracles into people, it allowed us to go right back to what he said in the text. When you become people of faith and patience. When you go back to Hebrews and it talks about faith at the end and patience. He had finally got them to the, the disciples to the point to where now their cars could be upgraded. They can be tuned up because now they were starting to believe without seeing. Doubting Thomas was one who still didn't believe. And Jesus told him, you can put your finger in the hole in my hand. Don't touch me because it ain't me that you're doubting. It's the spirit in me. So now put your finger in the hole in my hand. Now will you believe? And he tells them, bless are the ones who have not seen, yet they believe. Because now Thomas believes. But look at what it took. Thomas had to see the car to believe it. But blessed are the ones who don't have to see the car and rejoice with you because you have a new car. On the phone, they screaming and they shouting. You what you doing? I'm shouting. Wait a minute. I got my shout on. Blessed are those people that don't have to see your new vehicle, but they're rejoicing anyway for it. Riding solo, the promise is closer than we think. Discipline weighs ounces. Regret weighs tons. Discipline only weighs ounces, but regret weighs tons. Promises are sacred and verbal commitments that aren't meant to be broken. So when you're riding in your car, understand that at the end of your road, there's a promise. Your ultimate promise is never something intangible. That's a thing. The ultimate promise is a commitment that God has made to you before you were born. That if you live according to my word, you'll return back to me. Now they say that fathers, sons always want to return home to their fathers at some point. Father, sons meaning women and men in the supernatural. But a lot of us don't because our car won't make it. Because we're too embarrassed to go back home with a car that's barely running. You're too afraid to tell people that I'm a Christian, but I got a lot of issues right now. My oil needs change and I need a tune up. Tires are worn thin. I'm tired. But I won't let nobody know because I'm prideful and I hide behind my smile and I put on clothes and fresh cologne or perfume so people think I got it going on but inside I'm miserable. My transmission is barely working. It's skipping. But I won't let nobody know that. Because I don't want nobody to know how I'm riding. You've been waiting on some a long time. And it hasn't come yet. Keep waiting. But transfer a substitute waiting for trusting. Keep trusting. You're not waiting, you're trusting. And in your trusting comes the patience that was talked about in Hebrew that Jeremiah talks about as you go on in this chapter. It talks about the patience that the people had to get so that they can overcome discouragement. They could overcome 
the things that they lacked in their lives. Riding solo is necessary at some point if you're going to walk with Christ. Everything he endured, we endure. And he tells us that he's already given us the strength. These works and greater works shall you do in my name. You have to believe it. So tonight when you crank that car up, before you leave this place, tell yourself, God is getting ready to give me a brand new transmission. He's getting ready to give me a brand new motor. I'm getting some brand new spiritual headlights. And I got the Holy Ghost that's running through my car, that's taking away the, the place of the gas, that I never have to go and rear up again at another gas station because it's with me forever. The Bible said the Holy Ghost shall be with us until Jesus returns. Somebody say Ryan Solo. Put your hands together. God bless you tonight. You've just had an experience with champions, and we are so glad that you tuned in today. Let's continue to honor God through our commitment to give. There are four ways to give. You can give online via Cash App at dollar sign Champions for Christ. Next, you can give online at www.championsforchristim.org. Lastly, you can give during service or on our mobile app available in the Apple and Google Play stores. Please be sure to tune in each and every week to our online broadcast. Encourage others to tune in with you. Remember, we are champions because we are champions for Christ.